My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a Hollywood film and television editor, a documentary director, father of two, and creator of Optimize Yourself. Since beginning my career, I have battled attention issues, anxiety, and creative burnout more times than I can keep track of. Back in 2005, after almost losing the battle with suicidal depression, I decided that I no longer wanted to sacrifice myself for the sake of my career. I was done barely surviving. I wanted to thrive. Since then, I have obsessively searched for every possible way to optimize my own creative performance. My journey is far from complete, but I have now made it my mission to shorten your learning curve so you can forge your own path to greatness without having to sacrifice balance in the process. Now it's time to start designing the optimized version of you. Hello and welcome to a special episode of the Optimize Yourself podcast, where I provide my written articles in audio form so you have the opportunity to listen instead of read if that's your preference. My hope is that you're going to use this opportunity to get up and step away from your chair for the next 25 minutes and build the habit of moving more throughout your workday. The following is a reading of my article titled, Dear Zach, I'm having trouble finding work and I want to make sure I'm doing everything I can which can be found at optimizeyourself.me slash Dear Zach. And for the record, that is spelled Z-A-C-K. The article reading will begin after a brief break to recognize our sponsor who makes this podcast possible for you. This episode is made possible by ErgoDriven, the makers of the Topomat, my number one recommendation for anyone interested in moving more at their height adjustable workstation. The topo mat is scientifically proven to help you move more throughout your day, which helps reduce discomfort and also increase your focus and productivity. To learn more, visit optimizeyourself.me slash topo. That's T-O-P-O. On a weekly basis, I receive emails, Facebook messages, and tweets from people all over the world who work in creative fields. Some people send me pages worth of their life stories. Others are just looking for quick tips to optimize something very specific in their lives, but most often the messages that I receive are from people frustrated with where they are in their career who don't know where to go next. It occurred to me recently that the advice that I'm providing to an individual privately might actually be beneficial to many other people struggling with similar obstacles in their own lives. So here goes my very first attempt in a new series called Dear Zach. If you find this beneficial, please let me know in the comments for this article, or you can send me a quick message at optimizeyourself.me slash contact and let me know that you would like to read more of these in the future or submit your own question to possibly be used in a future article. So here it goes. Dear Zach, I've been editing pretty consistently for the past year and more, but recently I've been having trouble finding work and I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to better my chances. I've reached out to people that I have a good relationship with in the past, directors, producers, line producers, editors, etc., to let them know that I'm available. I've also reached out to agencies with not much luck, except for being hip-pocketed at two big-name agencies. Of course, I'm staying positive since I believe that I've been turning in good cuts and people have enjoyed working with me. But I just wanted to take the extra steps and see if I can learn from a person of your experience. Is there anything more that you did during a time like this other than have patience? Thanks, Martina. Hi, Martina. There is no doubt that patience is a required virtue when working to build a fulfilling career. One of the fundamental mindsets that I teach in all of my online programs is that life is a game of chess, not a game of checkers. You have to be willing to play the long game and stop looking for the next easy move. Just because a quick jump is available doesn't mean that it's the best strategy to win the game. Don't confuse patience with complacency, however. Oftentimes, people reach a certain point in their careers where they believe that they have earned the right to their next job, and all they have to do is wait to be discovered. No matter the level that you're at in your career, every single strategic move should have one singular objective. Putting yourself in the right place at the right time so the right people discover you, and thus, you get lucky. And by the way, I believe that luck is simply the intersection of hard work and opportunity. Now, I'm not implying in any way whatsoever that you are sitting around waiting to be discovered. Clearly, you're reaching out to past contacts, and you built a relationship with not one but two big-name agencies. This is a great start but you definitely haven't reached the point yet where there's nothing else that can be done except sit and be patient. 
If you follow my podcast and blog, then you may already know how I spent years jumping from one random indie project to the next, often unpaid. And I was also unemployed for long stretches before finally landing my dream job editing Burn Notice. While it's been a few years since being at this stage of my career, I still remember it like it was yesterday. Furthermore, I have yet to speak to a fellow editor, or most other professions in Hollywood for that matter, where people didn't struggle jumping to the next level in their careers. For example, it took Kelly Dixon, editor of shows like Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, and The Walking Dead, over 20 years of working as an assistant to become an quote-unquote overnight success story. Take a breath and know that this is all part of the journey. The only way to ensure failure is if you give up. Knowing that you are at a similar crossroads in your career today that everyone goes through at some point, here are three questions to ask to ensure that you are doing everything possible to put yourself in the right place at the right time to be discovered. By the way, I have also provided concrete action steps so you can start making shit happen. Question number one, do your resume and portfolio clearly demonstrate why you are the best fit for the jobs that you're pursuing? Based on your statement, I've been editing pretty consistently for the past year and more. I'll assume that you're not brand new to the game and you have some experience under your belt, and most likely you've probably assisted as well. If you did come up as an assistant editor like most people do, there's this place called the gray zone where it can be really tough to transition from assisting to only then taking editing work. This is a tough transition. Building a fulfilling career requires pursuing projects that align with your creative passions and your skill set. Sometimes this means making tough financial decisions and, <gasps> gasp, turning down what appears to be perfectly good work short term, like perhaps assisting, because it no longer aligns with your long term goals. If you simply need a paycheck job to cover your rent and groceries, then survival is priority number one, and you don't have the room to be picky. There's no shame in making a living. But approaching jobs with this mindset for an extended period of time can unfortunately lead to a less than perfect resume that some might consider a bit scattershot. And don't worry, my resume was like this for almost a decade. If you're concerned that one of the reasons you aren't being considered for job opportunities is because your past work experience might be less than ideal, let's get creative with how you present yourself while staying honest, of course. Action step, create multiple versions of your resume. Because I don't have a clear sense of your level of experience from your email, Martina, for the sake of argument, let's pretend that you have at least five years of industry experience, and let's say that some of that includes assistant work. Perhaps you have a scattershot portfolio of past projects that include some comedy work, but also commercials, trailers, documentary shorts, indie features, and several years as a TV assistant in multiple genres. If your goal with your resume is to show how much experience you have as a whole, having one generic list of all of your past projects can actually hurt you more than it helps you. At best, you have 30 to 60 seconds to convince someone that you are the right creative fit for the job. So make that decision as easy as possible by organizing your resume strategically for each potential opportunity. Pigeonholing is the reality in creative industries. While I don't believe that we should ever be limited to only doing one type of genre work, producers and directors are looking for a slam dunk. So give them the clearest picture possible of why your past experience makes you the right fit for this current opportunity, even if this means dropping a bunch of stuff from your resume that isn't the right fit. Now, if you don't feel that you have enough experience to drop anything, then at least have your resume flow in such a way that the most relevant work is listed first and the least relevant is on the bottom or even the next page. People commonly make the mistake of listing their work history chronologically as if they're applying for a middle management job at Microsoft. This isn't necessary in creative industries. In short, your resume has one job, demonstrating that you are the right creative fit. Make it as simple as possible and craft a unique version for each individual opportunity. Bonus action step. Make it brain dead easy to navigate your online portfolio. If you also have an online portfolio of sample work, organize it in such a way that people can find the right genre quickly. A homepage with every single piece of work that you've ever done only confuses the person who's considering you, especially if you're listing projects that you may or may not have edited at all. For example, let's say that you list projects that maybe you assisted on only. Think in terms of building funnels. If someone comes to your site and wants to only watch comedy or action or drama, etc., does your site flow in such a way that doing so is obvious and simple? 
If you haven't already, I suggest organizing your portfolio site with categories, tabs, tags, or anything else that allows a potential producer or director to curate your content instantly. And if you're old school and you still have a DVD reel, make multiple versions or even custom versions for each job application. And I know this sounds crazy, but my custom reel is the main reason that I landed the job on Burn Notice. When you reach out for potential jobs, in your email, provide direct links to specific examples of your past work. Do the hard work for them. While it might not be possible to have five different versions of a website, the way that you can have five unique versions of your resume, by providing the right breadcrumbs, you make it super simple for them. And you'll also feel confident that they're watching the right work at the right time. Lastly, if you worked on a specific show, don't just link to the homepage for that show on your website and expect others to dig through and find the right clips. Provide sample scenes directly on your site that demonstrate your best work on that series and list your specific contribution. If somebody sends me a link to watch their work and I end up on a YouTube landing page instead, I'm not going to watch anything because I don't know where to start or how this person was involved. In short, if your prospective employer can't find the absolute best clip that represents why you are the best fit for their project within 30 seconds, your site needs to be reorganized. Question number two, are you properly leveraging your past relationships? If you are good at what you do, once your foot is in the door and you have a few years under your belt, you will not build your career using your resume or your portfolio. You are going to build your career with referrals. One of the most frustrating parts about building a creative career in Hollywood is that most jobs are filled before you ever hear about them. You will most likely never know about 95% of the opportunities that might be perfect for you. If a job opening has become public knowledge, that simply means the people looking have already exhausted their contact list. So it is imperative that you stay relevant on that contact list so you are part of the insider conversations before employers are forced to recruit people on the outside. The great thing about building your career with referrals is that rather than always looking for work yourself or having just one agent potentially hunting down work for you, Instead, you have an entire network of producers, directors, editors, and other colleagues constantly referring you when jobs become available, and you are going to hear about a lot more than 5% of the opportunities that are a perfect fit for you without any effort at all. Sounds like a dream, right? The key to building a perpetual sales machine of friends and colleagues looking for work for you is maintaining those relationships even when you aren't working with them. Sure, it helps if you're the best editor that they've ever worked with and you're number one on their call list. But short of that, the next best strategy is to be the most recent person on their list. Most job opportunities are filled quickly. If someone comes to me asking if I know a good assistant, for example, I don't have a giant spreadsheet of every single great assistant that I've ever worked with in my career and their current availability. I don't take the time to weigh the pros and cons of each to determine who is the most deserving or the most able. The ones that I do think of right away and refer to others are often the ones that I've been in contact with most recently. Action step. Reconnect with people in your existing network, but without asking them to consider you for any upcoming opportunities. You mentioned in your email, Martina, that you're already reaching out to past colleagues to let them know that you're available. Instead of reconnecting simply to land your next job, instead think of a way that you can strengthen your relationship with them by providing value to their lives first. I recommend checking out the Socially Awkward Introvert's Guide to Networking if you're looking for creative ways to provide value to colleagues that you've worked with in the past. And that can be found at optimizeyourself.me slash networking. For example, rather than sending a mass email to everybody you've worked with in the past, updating them on your work history and your availability, and side note, rarely will I consider someone who has BCC'd me on a chain message, instead email each colleague individually and begin a conversation that shows genuine interest in what they're working on. End the email with an open-ended but simple question such as, hey, I read that you're currently directing XYZ film. It looks like a challenging project. Are you having fun? I hope it's as much fun as when you and I worked on ABC Project together. Start up a casual conversation. Try to slip in some in-jokes from past projects. Remind them that you're a fun guy or gal. After a couple of exchanges, there's no harm in mentioning that you would love the opportunity to work together again if they're looking. But providing value to them always comes first. Your needs come second. In short, 
Do your best to stay in contact with people who can refer work to you, but do so in such a way that you never actually have to ask them to consider you. Question number three, are you prioritizing the time to build new relationships? You mentioned in your email, Martina, that you are reaching out to people you already have a good relationship with, and you're also reaching out to agencies, but are you also working hard to expand your network and meet new people? Whenever I'm actively looking for my next project, I consider unemployment my full-time job, and my number one job duty is expanding my network of contacts. Similar to dating, the catch-22 of meeting new people is that it's nearly impossible to find the time to network while you're working, but when you're unemployed, you often reek of desperation because you need work now. Barring having a DeLorean parked in your garage so you can start building new relationships two years ago, the next best time to start networking and building them is today. But like connecting with past colleagues, when building new relationships, you cannot expect to get anything in return. Your only goal is to provide value to others. Here's why creating new relationships is so important, especially the higher that you climb the ladder. People do not hire based on experience nearly as much as they hire based on trust and comfort. I am inundated multiple times per week with emails that say the following. Hi, I'm just letting you know that I'm available and I would love to be considered if any opportunities arise. Here is the honest truth that few are willing to admit. People are not going to consider you or refer you for other open projects if they haven't worked in the trenches with you before. If someone is putting their name on the line, they need to know that you can hack it when the bullets are flying, deadlines are tight, and tensions are high. And even more importantly, they need to trust that you have a good attitude under pressure. If I've worked with someone in the past and I've not heard from them in a year, there's a very short list of people that I trust enough that I would refer jobs to if they simply sent me the I'm available for work again email. But if I have never worked with that person before, the I'm available email will have a 0% success rate, even if I like them personally. If a prospective employer is weighing your resume against someone else who has the same level of experience, they will always choose the person that they are more comfortable with. And if they don't know either candidate, oftentimes the tiebreaker goes to whomever has a stronger referral from within that employer's network. Therefore, your objective is to meet new people and make them comfortable with you so they trust hiring or referring you for a job in the future. Action step. Strategically build your dream list of contacts and then start reaching out. During several of the long stretches of unemployment earlier in my career, I developed what I now call the IMDB game. After having made the mistake for several years of taking the shotgun approach to networking and job hunting, that is, sending out hundreds of resumes and demo reels to every single job opening in the industry, I decided it was time to start using a sniper rifle instead. And yes, the shooter pun is intended. So here's how the IMDB game works. First, make a list of all of the dream projects that you would love to work on. At a minimum, choose five to 10 of your favorite TV shows or feature directors and producers or trailer houses, whatever makes the most sense for the type of work that you do. Research all of the relevant people that work on those projects and make a spreadsheet organizing them with the following columns. Name, current project, past relevant projects, potential connections, and their contact info. Then find any potential connections that you have in common. IMDB Pro has a great feature for this, but if you don't want to pay the membership fee, with a little elbow grease, you can dig through credits of their past projects to see if you've worked with any of the same people. Then, once you've compiled your list, begin reaching out to either your dream connections directly or reach out to people that you have both worked with in the past and see if you can get a brief intro. The likelihood of someone responding to you goes up exponentially if you are referred by someone that they trust. Above all else, remember that your main objective when reaching out to new contacts is not to land a job. Your sole purpose is to provide value to their lives. In short, when you're unemployed, expanding your network should become your full-time job. Rather than taking the shotgun approach, strategically approach the right people who are the best fit for the dream projects that you would like to work on. To summarize, unfortunately, there's no defined path to success in any creative career, especially filmmaking. But despite the lack of any road to follow, after interviewing many successful people, including editing legends such as Walter Murch, Carol Littleton, Kelly Dixon, Jeffrey Ford, and Billy Goldenberg, just to name a few, 
I've distilled what seems like a thousand different ways to make it into three very distinct steps that anyone can follow, all of which I discuss in detail in my ultimate guide to making it in Hollywood. Number one, you need a clear picture of the ladder that you want to climb. Number two, you have to do awesome work. And number three, people have to know that you do awesome work. And once again, if you want to download that guide, it's available at optimizeyourself.me slash Hollywood Ultimate Guide. Now, it sounds to me, Martina, like the area that you need to focus most of your attention is making sure the right people know that you do awesome work. Rather than being patient, here's a quick summary of the steps that you can take to ensure that you are making shit happen. First, customize your resume to fit each specific job opportunity. Then, organize your portfolio so prospective employers can find the right work quickly. After that, reconnect with past colleagues and connections, but without asking to be considered for a job. And then, strategically expand your professional network with people that are working on your dream projects. I hope that this helps you design your own unique roadmap to success. Be well. I hope you enjoyed the reading of my article, Dear Zach, I'm having trouble finding work and I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can, which can be found at optimizeyourself.me slash Dear Zach. I hope that you are inspired to take action in your life and that listening to this article gave you the opportunity to step away from your desk and incorporate a little bit of movement into your day. And as a final reminder, if you would like to reach out and ask me for advice for a future Dear Zach article, you can reach out at optimizeyourself.me slash contact. Thank you for listening. Be well. This episode of the Optimize Yourself podcast was made possible by Ergo Driven, the makers of the Topo Mat and Topo Mini, my number one recommendations for anyone interested in moving more at their height adjustable workstation. Listen, standing desks are only great if you're standing well. Otherwise, you're constantly fighting fatigue and chronic pain. Not like any other anti-fatigue mat, the Topo is scientifically proven to help you move more throughout the day, which helps reduce discomfort and also increase your focus and productivity. My friends at ErgoDriven did extensive testing and compared their product to the top-of-the-line floor mats, and they found the Topo drove almost two and a half more moves per minute with 270% more foot motion. Now, what this simply means is that the Topo users move more. I'm standing on one as I read this, and I don't go to a single job without it. And if you're smaller and you're concerned the topo mat is too big, or you simply don't have the floor space, there's a topo mini for that. To learn more, visit optimizeyourself.me topo. That's T-O-P-O.